So, my lords, if we can uh, then look at some of the, uh, the authorities. So, could you take the first authorities bundle? And go in that tab two, which is British Shalini's court. This was a case about the process for making artificial silk, um, also known as rayon. Uh, and we can pick up the judgment of Lord Tomlin at page 187 of the, the report, page 27 of the bundle. Yep. Uh, and if we look down, down at the bottom, um, it, it describes the process of the, the patent in suit. Um, process and the apparatus respectively claimed in the patent as a collocation of four integers, all of which are admittedly old, with downward extrusion, an enclosing casing, a current of hot air, a counter current of hot air, and outside winding. And then, so the following questions are uh, whether the collocation of integers was novel in 1920, whether if novel it had subject matter, and whether even if novel and prima facie possessed the subject matter, it was obvious in 1920. Uh, the, the jargon has subject matter was another way of saying whether it was a single invention or whether it was a, a, a collocation. Um, uh, and what, what Lord Tomlin then did was look at the various items of prior art, the patents that were, were relied upon. And on page 193, page 33 of the bundle, um, line 5, he says both the process claim and the apparatus greatest claim involve uh, a collocation of the four integers I've already mentioned. Each of these integers is admittedly uh, old. So he's found that each of them was, was known. And then, then assuming that the collocation of these four integers is itself novel, the question is what, what is the inventive idea connected with the collocation which constitutes uh, subject matter? Uh, and then he then describes the way the case was argued uh, in the House of Lords and how it was slightly different to how it had been put uh, below. But the important passage is at line 26, where he says, uh, it's accepted the sound law that the mere placing side by side of old integers so that each performed its own proper function independently of any of the others is not a patentable combination. But that where old integers, when placed together, have some working interrelationship, producing a new and improved or improved result, then there is patentable subject matter in the idea of the working interrelationship brought around by the collocation of the integers. So that's um, just pausing on, on that general statement of the law. Um, that is, it is a general statement. Uh, it's not tied to any particular type of claim or type of uh, technology. And indeed, as we've seen in, in the earlier passage in the judgment, the claim in question was, was a process. Uh, and then uh, Lord Tomlin looked uh, in the next passage uh, at the, uh, the argument as to why there was an interrelationship. Uh, and that was set out, uh, in, set those out in, the, in the passage that follows, um, that without the disadvantage of winding inside the casing, without affecting spinning, um, any degree of solvent recovery desired could be obtained. And without the disadvantage of winding in the casing, without limiting solvent recovery, Spinning speed could be increased, and then without limiting the possibility of complete solvent recovery, and without affecting spinning speed, um, the winding mechanism could be outside the casing. And he says that argument, of, although it has an attractive facade, is in my opinion raised on an unsound foundation. It's to be observed that the specification contains no reference to the results to be obtained. Uh, no doubt it's not, necess not necess unnecessary that it should do so. Uh, neither, however, does the way in any way limit or qualify the character of any of the integers. Just to give it any special quality for interrelated working other integers or any of them. And over the page, uh, he goes on at line nine, in truth and, and in fact, there is no interrelated working between the integers in the sense that any one of the integers is doing something which it could not do without the presence of the others. Each integer is in fact forming its own part and is not functionally dependent upon the presence of any other integer at all. I therefore think the invention lacks subject matter. <coughs> so points to draw out of, of this judgment. <coughs> Firstly, uh, the importance of um, the uh, functional interdependence and the, the working uh, interrelation between the parts. Uh, and secondly, that when considering those, uh, Lord Tomlin uh, was considering 
whether in fact there was any working interrelation between uh, the integers. Uh, and one can see that from looking at the bottom of uh, page 193, where he's looking at what the patent says about the working interrelation. And in his conclusion on 194, uh, in truth and in fact, there is no interrelation uh, interrelated working. And also, <coughs> I stress that because when we come and look at what the judge did in the judgment of this case, he looked at what the skilled person might have anticipated uh, in advance rather than looking at what in fact uh, occurred. Well, well, that's, well, that's yes, it's a bit odd though, isn't it? Because if you look further down on 194, um, at uh, lines uh, 37 and following, it's held, it's held that it's, the claim invention is obvious anyway. Yes. <laughs> so they, 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 the, the putting them together in any event would have been obvious. Yes. Um, but, but when specifically considering the collocation and the, and the subject matter issue, and whether the claim comprised patterns of subject matter, um, what the court was looking at was whether in fact there was any uh, interrelationship between the two, between the various parts. So that's uh, British uh, uh, Selenese. Could my lords go on to tab six, which is Sabbath, which uh, is also a House of Lords, but is under the current Act, under the 1977 Act. So for that reason, it's probably it is the leading case on, on uh, this issue in, uh, currently. And that concerns a uh, a hob, a cooking hob. Um, and if we can pick it up uh, on page 211 of the report, um, we can see what the case um, was concerned with. In paragraph 3, Lord Hoffman says, <coughs> During the first half of the last century, gas cookers consisted of a single unit with an oven below and a hob and grill uh, above. But the introduction of eye level oven and work surface hobs as separate units made it desirable for the hob and its burner to take up as little vertical space uh, as possible. So that was the problem the pattern was directed at. It was in a further issue, which is, uh, perhaps if my lords could just read um, paragraph 40 or so. Well, yes, but before we read on, you say the problem, but in fact, paragraph <coughs> 4 identifies two problems. Yes. Um, and that's important, because this is what in EPO speak is called partial problems. So you have within the claim two integers, each of which are separately solving in separate and independent problems. Yes, and the, the second problem was how to get enough oxygen into the, the gas flow, which is what um, Lord Hoffman deals with in paragraph four. Um, perhaps my law school can just, just read yep. that. So the Venturi effect was a way of getting enough oxygen into the, into the, the flame to ensure complete combustion. Uh, and in, in paragraph 5, Lord Hoffman says, the pipe was a substantial piece of hardware taking up space beneath the hob. Uh, and therefore, um, the patent specification um, described the, um, the advantage of its burners as being dealing with both the problem of having the air intake, but also dealing with the Venturi in a a narrow and thin hob. So we see in paragraph 6, an object of the invention was therefore to, be, to provide a gas burner of very low height, which can therefore be used with advantage in hobs, which must be flat. This was achieved uh, by enabling both the air intake and the venturi intake, the venturi effect, to take place above instead of below uh, the hob. And uh, and the particular way that the Venturi was achieved was by something we don't need to understand what it is, but it was called a radial Venturi uh, that worked uh, above the hob. So then if you turn over to page 213 of the report, in the obviousness section, um, having set out uh, the relevant sections of the Act, Lord Hoffman, um, in paragraph 13, says that Mr. Justice Laddie summarised Sabbath's claim at paragraph 12, to inventiveness by reference to three disadvantages of the prior art for which the invention was said to be designed to overcome. They were, first, the existing burner units are tall, so they don't fit into slim hobs. 
second, the primary air, which is entrained with the combustible gas, comes from underneath the hobby unit. And then there was a third effect, which the judge then um, uh, dismissed. In the next paragraph, when he came to deal with the question of obviousness at paragraph 44, he returned to his analysis. As I mentioned, the two important features of Sabbath burners is that it constitutes an invention of the drawing of primary air uh, in from above the hobby unit and the use of a flow path under the flame spreader in which the venturi effect needs to be present. As I've mentioned, there's nothing in the specification to suggest, nor has it been seriously argued, that these two features uh, interact with each other. And just pausing on that last sentence, uh, what we see is, is in a similar way to Lord Tomlin uh, in British Selenese. Is the judge in this case is considering whether in fact there was an interaction between uh, the two parts uh, and was also looking at what the patent specification said about it uh, to answer that question. And then in the next, um, <coughs> next paragraph, uh, Lord Hoffman refers to the prior art that was, was cited. Uh, and um, in paragraph 16, over the page, uh, he, he notes that Mr. Justice Daly decided, having heard the evidence, that both the inventive features were obvious in the prior art, and having regard to documents called Howdry and Zanussi, it would have been obvious to use a radial venturi, <coughs> and likewise having regard to energy technique inox, it would have been obvious to have an air intake which intruded into, uh, into the space, not into the space below the hob, but take air from above. But he makes the point that neither there was no single piece of prior art that took both that disclosed both features. But then at the last sentence, but neither made the other function any differently or produce any combined effect, except that each contributed separately to produce a slim hob which was suitable for a work surface uh, over uh, a cupboard. Now, just a couple of points on the on the basis of that last sentence. Um, the relevant interaction when one's considering these collocations is whether uh, one element uh, functions differently or produce uh, than it would do in the absence of the other. Not just whether there's any relationship, because of course in, in the hob in Sabah, at one level, the air intake brought the air in and fed it into the, into the, uh, the radial venturi. So at one level, there was a connection in the same way in the sausage machine case, the, the mincer sends the mince into the, the stuffer. But the key point is the fact, and the key, the key criteria is whether one element makes the other function any different. <clears throat> and the second point to pick up from this uh, paragraph is um, that the fact that the hob in question was uh, was a slim hob that was suitable for a work surface over the cover, so it was a useful hob is not an answer to the question as to whether it's a collocation. So merely because the collocation has benefits isn't an answer to, uh, to the issue. Now, um, Lord Hoffman then referred to what Lord Tomlin said in, in British Selenese, and then in paragraph 18, uh, he referred to the, um, the guidelines uh, for a substantive examination from the EPO. And perhaps my laws could just read the quotation from the guidelines down from the bottom of the page and actually over to the second line on the page, um, page 
so, so Lord Hoffman considers that the EPO applies the same principles uh, as those he's just explained, uh, and the approach the EPO takes is looking uh, as to where there is a combined technical effect which is different from and greater than the sum of the individual technical effects. Uh, in other words, there must be a synergistic effect, otherwise there's a mere aggregation. And at the bottom of the page, the other way they express this is that whether the known devices functioning in a normal way and not producing any non-obvious working interrelationships. Uh, and so it's clear when the EPO are talking about synergy, they're talking about this uh, the, the non-obvious working uh, interrelationships. Now, well, we've got the current versions of the, the guidelines in, in the bundles, and I shan't go to them because they are uh, in substance the same as they were um, uh, set out in the, the Sabbath case. And then, um, having dealt with it or, or, or considered the judgments of the, the Court of Appeal, uh, Lord Hoffman, in paragraph 24 on page 215, um, concludes that the approach of the Court of Appeal was contrary to um, the principles both in England and the EPO. I quite agree there's no law of collocation in the sense of a qualification or gloss upon the text of obviousness in section 3. But before you can apply section 3 and ask whether the invention involves an inventive step, you first have to decide what the invention is. In particular, you have to decide whether you're dealing with one invention or two or more inventions. Two inventions don't become one merely because they're in the same hardware. A compact motor car may contain many inventions, each operating independently of each other, all designed to contribute to the overall goal of having a compact car. That does not make the car a single invention. And then over the page, in paragraph 26, uh, he then applies the test from uh, the guidelines and the fourth line down if two integers, integers interact upon each other if there's synergy between them they constitute a single invention having a combined effect and one applies section 3 to the idea of combining them if each integer performs its own proper function independently of any others then each is for the purpose of section 3 a separate invention and it has to be applied to one separately that in my opinion uh, is what Laddie meant by the law of collocation and then in paragraph 27, um, he upheld uh, the decision of Mr. Justice Laddie because having found uh, that the two parts had no effect on each other, uh, it was then correctly characterized as a, as a collocation uh, and obvious. Well, uh, that's, that's the English uh, case law. What we've also put in the bundle is two, a case from the French Supreme Court and a case from the Dutch Supreme Court. I'll just take the logic of those just briefly to show that they, those, those member state courts also apply uh, the same principles. That's the second authorities bond. Tab 19 is the French Supreme Court. And so it's uh, tab 19, page 900 of the, the bundle. This is the, uh, the Carmeurs uh, case, CMF products. And, and if my lords perhaps go to uh, page 902 of the bundle, which is uh, 471 in the top right hand corner, there's uh, a paragraph that says, Where's Carmeurs, Lime, and CMF products, and someone else is going to file a grievance that the judgment and do declare the nullity of the claims of the French patent um, for lack of inventive step, and according to the plea. And my lord, this first paragraph is effectively the, the grounds of appeal. And perhaps you could read that to yourself. Um, the translation is perhaps not the most um, subtle. So you can forget you read it.
effectively the point that was put was that the, the, the court below was wrong to consider it as a, a combination, not to consider it as a combination, that you should have considered uh, all the integers, whether all the integers in combination together were obvious. And if one goes over the page, the bottom of uh, page four at the top, actually, um, the Supreme Court says that given initially that having held claim one was constituted of a set of already known methods, each having a specific technique of effect, participating in the optimization of each step described in the process, without their combination having an unusual synergy effect, the Court of Appeal legally justified its decision to hold the claim was not a combination as it's mentioned. So there we see unusual synergy effect. That's, uh, in my submission, the same as the non-obvious working relationship that we see in the, in the guidelines. The, the, the other case uh, is in the next tab, which is from uh, the Netherlands. And this is uh, what, we, what we put in the bundle. Is this is the opinion of Advocate General Van Persen uh, in the Supreme Court, and the next tab is the actual Court of Appeal. So sorry, apologies, my words. The Supreme Court judgment. Uh, Advocate General Van Persen deals with the merits of the appeal. Uh, we needn't turn up the Supreme Court uh, judgment because they dismiss the appeal on the basis that it doesn't raise a ground of uh, sufficiently sufficient importance for them. Um, so what I'd like to look at is, is, is the Advocate General's uh, opinion setting out the, the law. Uh, and as we see at the bottom of page 917, the first page of the, of the opinion, um, there were the, comp the, uh, the patterns had been found to be uh, uh, obvious, uh, and the complainant by the appellants had, there were three points that were raised. The first one in the fourth line was the Hoodwood rule, then there was a point about secondary indicia, and then three lines from the bottom, also according to Coloplast, the assessment of the Court of Appeal of the combination invention issue do not stand the test in the cessation, uh, and then, in my opinion, these tests have been presented in vain. And then if we turn on to um, page 929, uh, actually two, here, the Advocate General deals with the various principles of, of law. My Lord's turn over to uh, 930 and dealt with the could wood approach right at the bottom 2.6. Um, the guidelines deal with combination inventions. Uh, and perhaps my Lord's could just read quickly to yourselves uh, the, well, the that's next. It's essentially the same. It's essentially the same, my Lord. So we've seen it before. Yeah. It's just a current version of the guidelines. Yeah. Uh, and also, in 2.7, he actually quotes from the, the case law book as well, which is the partial problem law that my lord has referred to. So yeah. I, I think on that, that basis, it's going to be in any, any more detail. It's, it's applying the same law that we've, we've seen. Um, when they actually, he actually comes to apply the law to the facts, it's a bit more complicated because he thought that the, um, the decision of the court of appeal had been misunderstood. But, but it's clear that he set out the law on... Um, combinations versus collocations uh, in the same terms that we've seen from the, the case law. So, uh, my lords, just, just trying to draw those principles together and, and, and to make my submissions on, on, on the correct approach as a matter of law. Um, the first question, the first point is, the first question is one has to ask the question whether a there's one or two or more uh, inventions. To determine that, the court needs to ask the question whether the two parts interact with each other such that there is a uh, synergy or a non-obvious working uh, interrelationship between them, or whether in contrast there's just a juxtaposition of known parts working and performing their own function independently of the other. If the answer is, is that the former there is synergy or non obvious working to relationship, then the invention, the claim is to a combination and needs to be considered as a whole. But if it's the latter, each can be considered separately uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter if both those elements contribute to the same overall goal. Next, assessing whether there's synergy or a non obvious working into relationship uh, is a question of fact relating to the product or the process subject of the claim itself. 
none of the authorities, is there any consideration of asking whether the school person would have thought there was a potential for an interaction in advance of actually making the process of the product in question. Uh, and certainly we don't see that being determinative of the collocation issue. So, uh, and the final point is that the collocation principle is, is a general one uh, and it applies to, in principle, to any and all types of claim. And in particular, there's no basis to suggest that it's fundamentally incapable of applying to chemical molecules. Uh, and indeed, we say the judge was right to have rejected that submission uh, in his judgment. And I think, well, well, the final point is to ask is just to deal with the, ask the question of why, why does the collocation principle exist? Uh, and well, we say that the reason why it exists is to prevent patent monopoly is being granted, where all the patentee has done is to take two old or obvious things, put them together in circumstances where each of those things do exactly what they would do had the other one not been there. And in effect, it's a way of the law deeming that there be no inventive step and no invention in merely putting two independent components together in the same thing. Well, that can't be right, because as we've seen, um, the law of collocation applies um, where it's not obvious to put the two things together. Well, it, it sort of depends what one means by, by obvious. It may, in the sense of, if you start from document <coughs> A, would it be obvious to put things why together. In that sense, the law of collocation does apply and does say that that combination isn't inventive, even if starting from any single starting point, you wouldn't have got to the combination. And it's a way of a way of a way of preventing monopolies being granted merely by placing two independently obvious things together. Indeed, that that way of putting it, I would accept. That's not quite the same as what you said before. Oh, I and, and yeah, we see the difference from Sabbath, where one of the f two features was obvious from two items of prior art, the other was obvious from two different items of prior art, and it was found that there was no item of prior art which pointed to both. Yes, so on, on a conventional English approach to obviousness starting from a single citation, you would say there was no, there's no obvious way of putting the two together. Yet the law of collocation stops 20 year monopolies being granted when all someone has done is put together those two obvious things which don't interact, even if it couldn't be shown from a single starting point. That yeah, and the rational f rationale for it is that identified by Lord Hoffman, <coughs> namely that in substance, in reality, what you're dealing with is independent invention. As my Lord noted, we see in the EPO, uh, the guidelines and in the case law, the reference to partial partial problems, and that's what they're the two two problems they dealt with. Yeah. So, my Lord, can we now have a look at the uh, the judgment in this this case? So that's back to the core bundle tab six, and we can pick it up at paragraph four hundred and sixty. with the law, uh, and as we say in our, our skeleton, we don't say that insofar as the judge summarised the law in this section, he said had anything that wasn't correct. The complaint is that when he came to apply uh, to look at the issue and the facts of this case, uh, he did something different. And so the judge sets out um, the relevant passages from Sabbath. Uh, and he, in 465, he resolved a, a minor dispute between the parties as to what was meant in, in British Selenese, I think it was in Passover. Um, over the page 466, the judge um, took two points from Mr. Justice Kitchen's decision in Abbott and uh, Evizio. Now, this was not a case that either party had referred the judge to, 
Um, but just to deal with the two points that he, he made, um, so Professor Miles can just, just read that. The first point that the judge made um, was that the applicability of the principle was decided by reference to the claim rather than to focus on the, it was on the kind of prior art, which was the way the arguments in front of him were uh, focused. Uh, and, and what are we saying in relation to that? But of course, it was never suggested that the way that the moieties in the overall molecule in this case were uh, dissected. Well, you're coming on to then to the facts of the present case. I thought what you were addressing is at this stage on the law. Um, do you take issue with what he says about the law? Oh, no. Right. But but it, it doesn't matter in this case because it suggests that no one suggests that the way that the molecule has been broken down with the fluorophore on the one side and the linker on the other is anything other than the, the logical way to break the molecule up. It's not an artificial dissection of the the overall molecule. I'm not sure that what, what that's got to do with what he says in 467 at all. Yeah. Uh, by all means, develop that point in due course, but the point he makes at 467, I don't understand to be in dispute between the parties. Namely, you've got to look at what's claimed. Yes. Um, I'll move on. And, and, and the second one, um, Mr. Justice Kitchen referred to the fact that there was an interaction between the elements of which the designer of the relevant product must take in, into consideration. Again, the, the point to draw from that is, of course, that Mr. Justice Kitchen was looking at the fact that there was an interaction in, in that case, and it was a stent case between the various design elements of the stent. Uh, and um, that's what we say that is the, that was the correct approach that the judge took in, in the Abyssinia case. Uh, and as we'll come on to see, it's not what the judge did uh, in this case. Um, so, my lords, if we then go on to, to the part of the judgment when the judge dealt with the collocation issue, that starts uh, on page 183, um, paragraph 501. And then over the page... Uh, 504, the judge refers to um, our submission that the 415 pattern is written on the basis that the claim molecule is made up of building blocks, dyes, linker, and nucleotides. Um, he says that's true, and whilst it does give some support, it's not determinative. Almost all inventions can be decided made out of parts, but that's not an omission by the pattern, which is part of the uh, collocation. Uh, and Although the judge said it gave some support, it, in fact, when he came back to consider the issue, he didn't come back and, and reconsider um, this point. But we, we do we do maintain that it is a point of, of importance as to how the pattern saw the elements. Then in 505, the judge referred to the fact that the claim molecule as a whole has useful properties, um, that it can be used in, in sequencing. And then, as he correctly noted, just because the combined molecule has useful properties does not answer the question. The Hobbin Sabbath was useful to the little, very little space as possible. However, this useful property was the result of two obvious independent features operating independently, and so it was invalid. And we say that, that that's a key point, because at times in his skeleton, my friend refers to the fact that um, the molecule is useful. And, and we say that the, the judge was right to say that that isn't an answer uh, to the question. Then, um, paragraphs 507 to 509, are ones that my friend places um, considerable weight on. So perhaps my lords could just read those quickly to yourselves again.
So the witnesses were both both agreed that it was that adding a linker may change the properties of the die. The difference between them was on the degree to which they thought that was that was likely. Professor Greenberg thought it was more likely than, than uh, Professor Johnson. Um, but the judge and the judge held that Professor Johnson. Um, evidence would have uh, been powerful evidence in an obviousness case in which one of those steps was to be considered was the prospects of success that might that might be in combining a single molecule uh, into a single in a single molecule the four carbon linker form of di sixteen with the derivative di. That's not the relevant question. Indeed it isn't. And then the judge then in five hundred and ten goes on to say that the fact that the claim thing is a single molecule. The evidence is clear that two aspects of the molecule are capable of interacting. There's a potential for interaction between these aspects which the skilled person must always take into consideration. The fact that the interaction is one which would be unhelpful does not mean it's not relevant. This is essentially an empirical field would not know whether there is a fact of interaction until a test is done. The fact that the test is not burdensome um, they would need to be done. So the judge is here bringing in the issue of the idea of um, what the skilled person would think whether they were able to predict uh, in advance whether there'd be an interaction. He then tries to distinguish, the judge does distinguish, Favin on the basis in that case, um, he says there was no basis for thinking that there might be an interaction and then looking to find out. Now, well, that's not how the Supreme Court looked at it, or the House of Lords looked at the issue in they were looking at it as a matter of fact. And one, what one doesn't get from any of the judgments, or Hoffman's judgments in particular, is any, uh, any assessment of what the skilled person might have thought in advance, and any finding that no skilled person would have thought that any now, possibility... I'm a little bit puzzled by your repeated statement that this is a question of fact. I don't understand that. Because surely it's a question of construction of the pattern. It's therefore a question of law, isn't it? Well, yes. So, my lord, when I say a question... Well, you say fact, yes. Well, I, let me be clear. Are you accepting that it's not a question of fact, but a question of law? Well, construction of a, of a patent is a question of law, yes. Right. The issue about whether there is one or two inventions in a claim is an issue that one has to look at looking at the invention knowing properties of the And it's a question of interpretation of the pattern, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it has a factual dimension in that, as always, we read the pattern through the eyes of the skilled person or team, and therefore with the benefit of their common general knowledge. So, as with all questions of interpretation, um, one has to start with the findings of fact as to the common general knowledge. But beyond that, it's a question of interpretation and therefore a question of law, isn't it? Yeah, and the, the, the contrast I was seeking to draw is between, on the one hand, when one's considering the question, do the parts of this combination, collocation, interact with each other? What the court's got to consider is whether they do, in fact, interact with each other. And what I'm seeking to contrast that with, which we say is the wrong approach, is merely asking the question, thinking about it in advance of the patent, would the skilled person have thought that there might be an interaction? Because ultimately, the question of collocation is, is a question of, is there in fact an interaction between the two parts of this invention? Not, might there have been? Well, suppose that the patent says in terms that there is an interaction between the two parts. What then? Well, if the patent said there was an interaction, and for example, in this case, if it showed that the fluorescent properties of the molecule changed significantly on conjugation, then well, we will accept that would be a it would be an interaction that would would deal with that would meet, take the molecule out of the collocation. Problem. And what if it, the statement in the patent turned out, when tested, to be incorrect? Well, it, like all statements in patents, they're always contradictory by, by the evidence. Indeed. So 
So, so I mean, ultimately, my lord, the, the statements in the patent are evidence. But, but let me be clear. Take my hypothesis. The patent asserts that the two features interact synergistically. Let's imagine it says that in terms. But when tested, subsequently, it turns out that that's incorrect and there's no synergy. Then it would be a collocation. If, if in fact there is no interaction, then what the patentee has in fact claimed is a, is a collocation of two obvious parts that don't interact and he doesn't deserve a monopoly. So, the, 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 so, the so that would suggest that it's not a question of interpretation of the patent at all. It is, as you originally said, a pure question of fact to be proved by experiment by the party attacking the patent. Is that correct? Well, it's, it's a question. It's a question of, of yes, my lord. Because ultimately, the question is: Is there an interaction? So you accept it's a question of fact, and the burden of proof is on you well, as the party attacking the patent to show that there is no interaction. It's my burden to show obviousness. And we obviously we, have, we haven't got to the judge's findings on the level of interaction. But do you accept the burden is upon you to establish the facts, viz that there is no interaction? Yes. OK. Thank you. We go to paragraph 511. The judge says, as I've already indicated, unlike Sabat, this case is about unwelcome interaction. The dye fluoresces satisfactorily in the 415 pattern because, in fact, the lens and the leucocyte do not interact with it in an unfavorable way. Now, well, we do have a finding of fact that there is no interaction. Sorry, where are you? Beginning of 511. Judge then explains that the dye linker combination does not, in fact, prevent incorporation of the nucleotide with the DNA polymerase. It might have, but it does not. So, of course, my lord will recall the judge also found that there was a reasonable prospect of it. Uh, and then he then repeats the point about the circumstances being different from Sabat and there being no suggestion that there was a capability um, of interaction in that case. And then the judge draws, draws it his, his reasoning together in 512. Um, if the single molecule made from the four carbon linker version of di 16 and the derivatized uh, nucleotide plus linker, a skilled person would, would believe these two parts are capable of interacting with one another. There's nothing inherent in other elements that means that it's incapable of interacting with the other. The di part is not a priori meaningfully flexible link until the nucleotide. A skilled person would hope they would work satisfactorily because the two do not interact, but it needs to be demonstrated in, by an experiment testing the combination as a whole. That means the collocation principle doesn't apply. So the judge's reasoning for, think, for concluding that the collocation principle does not apply uh, was the skilled person's expectation that there might be an interaction, uh, not that, in fact, uh, there was. Uh, and we say that coming to those conclusions, the judge made it in summary two errors. The first one is looking at the issue of predictability in advance. Uh, and the second one is equating the absence of an unfavorable interaction as being relevant to the collocation principle when the authorities are clear that the relevant criteria is one's looking for the, for the presence of synergy. Because the absence of an interaction merely another way of saying that the two parts do the same thing that they would do without the other. Uh, now, as to that first error, predictability, um, my laws anticipate my, my submission that there's no basis for that in any of the authorities that we've seen. And all 
those cases, the court looks at what the patent states about the invention claimed uh, and whether, in fact, there is an interaction between the public. Second, when the judge sought, when the judge, the judge, the way the judge sought to distinguish Sabat from this case was by by uh, by the fact that Sabat, his conclusion was that there was no basis for thinking Sabat and the parts didn't interact with each other, and we say that's not something one can get out of Sabat. It's not a uh, the judge's interpretation of Sabat. It's not it's certainly one doesn't see in any of the judgments in Sabat a statement that. Everybody would know these don't interact with each other. Um, that, that wasn't how it was approached in Sabah. Uh, well, and we, but also, insofar as the judge was seeking to distinguish chemical molecules from mechanical inventions like Sabah or processes like um, Pritisalanine, um, and we say that there's no basis in any of the authorities or the guidelines to treat chemical molecules any differently from any other type of, of invention. Uh, and one only has to ask, ask the question, if, if a patent isn't justified merely because two, or because two parts of a mechanical device, for the obvious, don't interact, why, why should you get a patent merely because you have two parts of a chemical molecule? It would be illogical to give to deprive a patent in one in the first circumstance, but not in not in the second. And in effect, given the nature of chemistry, um, it would it would be tantamount to saying that you could never have a collocation in any chemical case if you brought the predictability point into play. But that was the point that my friend Mr. Acklin specifically made to the judge at trial, which the judge uh, rejected. Uh, in paragraph 469 of the, the judgment, he said, in principle, the, pr the collocation principles are applicable to all types of case. Mm -hmm. and, and my lord, it also would bring, we would submit, would be some odd, odd outcome if one thinks about it. The first odd outcome in our submission is the fact of, of this case, which is that you, you ask the question, would the skilled person anticipate that there might be an interaction between the parts in advance and decide the collocation issue on that basis when in fact it turns out that there is no interaction between the parts. But of course the other way around is even more problematic. If one takes a, a situation where a school person might consider in advance that there was uh, no prospect of an interaction but in fact surprisingly it turns out there is, uh, on the judge's approach, you would deprive the patentee of a patent because you say there's no prospect of an interaction in a case like Sabat, therefore it's a collocation. And one doesn't actually look at the, the true picture, which is when you do make that collocation, whether there's any interaction between the two of them. And ultimately, why is there any need to consider the issue of predictability when one can always look at the position as to the true position as to when you make the invention, whether there is in fact any interaction between the two parts um, alleged to be the collocation. Uh, and, and finally, my Lord, on, on this point, we do say that this, this, this isn't going to be a point that's going to come up in, in many other cases. It's not going to be a point that would be taken against all chemical product claims for the reasons I explained this morning that one often one usually can't dissect isopropanol into propane and water and say that it's a collocation of those two parts of uh, those two earlier molecules. That doesn't apply in the vast majority of cases. This case is a somewhat unusual one given the nature of the moieties that have been uh, joined together. I have some difficulty with that proposition. I mean, it's obviously true that you can't dissect small molecules, but synthetic or organic chemistry, which is a very well-established and large discipline, is all about putting together what you've called building blocks. That's the name of the game. Yes. And, and you can always, conceptually, dissect 
the target molecule into the building blocks. That's how you fact you do it. It's called retrosynthetic analysis. Um, we saw mention in the papers of E.J. Corey, who invented retrosynthetic analysis. Um, you start by defining your target, and then you think backwards as to how you're going to make it from available starting materials. So, you, in other words, you think about what are the potential building blocks that you're going to put together, like pieces of Lego, to produce your target molecule. That's, that's how, how it works in all, almost all cases. Yeah. So, this would apply to any case involving synthetic organic chemistry. Well, I mean, in principle, I mean, because the principle ought to apply to all, all inventions. But obviously, it's always a question of the fact and degree whether it's going to apply in any particular case. And if one's talking about, well, I'm replacing a hydrogen atom with a fluorine, then of course that kind of a change is not one that you can dissect out and say the fluorine's doing what the fluorine always does and the rest of it's doing what the rest of it always does. And just the fluorine is electronegative, it will change the electron density of the overall molecule, and all sorts of complicated interactions occur. But in this case, where we're talking about, firstly, with fluorescence properties in particular, that's what the pattern is about. And the, the, the molecule, the fluorescent part of the molecule when it's attached, the fluorescent molecule when it's attached to the linker is merely joined to it in a way that doesn't affect its, its properties. There's no adverse interaction. Um, this is one of those, what we say would be an unusual case, where you can say that the dye is doing what the dye always did and is fluorescing when it's irradiated with light, uh, and, and the linker is still joining still attached to the nucleotide and enables anything to be attached to the end of it. Uh, and the fact that they've been put together doesn't affect the way either of them function. Well, that, that's the judge's, we say, his first error. The second one I can do very briefly, which is the equating the absence of an adverse interaction with the synergy that the case law um, requires. And we say that's simply not the approach that the law uh, takes. Uh, and indeed, it's the very opposite of the approach the law takes, because it, it's, it's taking this claim outside the collocation principle sort of because there is no interaction between the parts. But that's a bit puzzling. I mean, you pressed upon us um, the fact that this principle shouldn't be used to deprive patentees of meritorious inventions. But suppose the expectation of every single skilled person in the art was that if you put elements A and B together, there will be a destructive interaction between the them, and therefore they would never think of doing it. But the patentee demonstrates, contrary to everybody's expectation, that you can put elements A and B together and there's no destructive interaction. Why shouldn't he get a patent for that? Well, because ultimately he's put two obvious elements together. But it's not obvious for the reason that I've just articulated, because the skilled person would never do it because they would think it would be disastrous. But there was no evidence in Sabat person would take the two elements from Sabbath and put them together either. No, no, but, but I'm, I'm testing your proposition that as a matter of law, it cannot be relevant that there is an absence of unfavorable interaction, because that's your submission. Yes, very much. So what's the answer to the scenario that I've given you? You say, tough. <coughs> well, I think, I think it does come down to that because ultimately, what the, what the, what the patentee has done in those, those circumstances, on the hypothesis that the two elements are old and ob obvious, which is one we're working with, yeah. he's put two old and obvious elements together, yeah. and they don't interact with each other, and that's what the law the law says that that's that's not an invention. <coughs> okay, well that's clear. Thank you. And well, there's there's, there's a. I think a further point that, as we've seen, the judge considered the issue of predictability and the issue of um, the lack of, the absence of an interaction. Uh, and um, what, what he 
never, what he didn't consider was whether the lack of inter or the lack of an interaction, the assumption that it's relevant, would have been a, a non-obvious lack of an interaction. We've seen from the, the cases that the EPO characterised the requirement to be a, a non-obvious working interaction. If we assume, we go with the judge this far, that what you're looking for is a non is a non-obvious non-interaction. Um, both the experts were agreed that there might be an interaction. They differed in the degree in which they thought it was, was likely. But neither of the experts suggested that it wasn't obvious that there might not be an interaction either. There was clearly one uh, obvious possible outcome um, of combining the dye and the linker together. Uh, and we say, if the judge had asked that question, question from the EPO guidelines, um, the answer ought to have been that, inter that lack of an interaction was not a, not a non-obvious lack of interaction, it was an obvious lack of interaction. And that's another relevant factor that should push this case into the collocation um, principle. example of, of two pits being put together that everyone thought would have have an adverse interaction I mean, that would be a, that would be a, that would be a question of a non-obvious non-interaction so it, it, if one picks up the, if one looks at the way the EPO do at the end of uh, the guidelines looking at that one's still looking at a non-obvious non-interaction on the assumption that the looking at non-interaction We say if the judge had approached the case on the correct basis and looked at whether there was, in fact, any synergistic or non-obvious interaction, he ought to have held that there wasn't on his own findings that there was no interaction between the two parts of the molecule. Uh, and on that basis, he should have held that this was a case that falls into the collocation principle. Uh, and we say that would not be, that's not an unfair uh, conclusion. The Milton prior art clearly discloses that its linker and nucleotide can be used with any suitable dye. Uh, and all that this patent had done was taken another suitable rhodamine uh, and attached it to the linker in circumstances where there's nothing special about the particular combination. The dye just attaches to the linker uh, and fluoresces. Um, and we say, um, ultimately, for that reason, uh, and uh, the, the application of the collocation principle in this case is not one that could be seen as being harsh uh, on the patentee. Um, merely, merely taken another die uh, from the class suggested by Milton uh, and uh, added it to the linker. Well, Lord, unless I can think of any further. Uh, no, thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Mullows. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, with your leave, address you first of all on facts as found by the judge, uh, then uh, turn to the law, and I think in the light of uh, my the friend's submissions, I think we can be fairly brief on the law, in fact, and then finally the judge. Now, as far as the facts are concerned, uh, your lordships have the benefit of a judgment from the judge in which key findings are made. Now, you've been shown certain paragraphs from uh, the judgment in relation to common general knowledge and the, uh, the effect uh, of the uh, various components. Uh, can I just uh, take you to uh, one or two additional paragraphs and emphasize 
some points which my learned friend uh, <coughs> didn't uh, refer you to. So if we could start at 433. 433. This is uh, in the judges section on the common general knowledge. Um, and my learned friend uh, uh, took you to a part of 433. Can, can I emphasize, please, uh, what is in the last three lines? So this is in the context of fluorophores for use for sequencing. Uh, the fluorophores should be bright and photostable and not interfere with the reactions taking place in sequencing by synthesis. Now, obviously, one of those reactions in a sequencing by synthesis reaction is, of course, the incorporation of a nucleotide by the DNA polymerase. Um, nothing additional to add on 434. Um, my learned friend took you to 435, and uh, 435 is, is an important uh, uh, series of findings by the judge. And, and could I just emphasize uh, what he says in the first uh, three sentences. In the end, this is an empirical field. The characteristics of individual moieties within a chemical structure are influenced by their environment. Molecules can be drawn out flat on a page, but as the skilled person knows, there are in fact three dimensional structures which can move. Oh, sorry, one additional uh, sentence. Parts which look remote on the page can interact with more distant parts because the whole molecule can adopt a shape uh, in which that is true. And um, uh, that is a, a, a short uh, but uh, pithy and entirely accurate account of a, a key part of common general knowledge, which I should be coming back to. Um, well, the judge looks at the uh, sequencing experiments uh, in the pattern. And if I can ask you, Lordship, to go to 445 and 446. In 445, he refers to example 11, uh, explains that it discloses a method of sequencing by synthesis using reversible chain terminators. The scanning is done with four colors. Paragraph 203 of the patent explains that during the first 20 cycles, the error rate was less than 1%. And in 446, this indicates, this indicates to the skilled person, one puts in parentheses, that the SBS system performed well and that the fluorescently labelled modified nucleotides produced a clear signal to permit reliable detection. The judges uh, uh, looked at uh, that data, and uh, that is how he has characterised uh, its, its, its core teaching at that point. And what he goes on to do is to uh, evaluate the uh, significance of those results. So if your lordships turn, please, to 496. This is in uh, a section of the judgment, lack of technical contribution. And you can see in 496 that the judge is here dealing with uh, MGI's alternative case. And that is uh, over Milton, which discloses the LN3 linker and a nucleotide, but in conjunction with a different uh, uh, fluorescent uh, fluorophore. The submission was being made that actually the, the patent in suit doesn't provide any technical advance over Milton because Milton has a general teaching to use rotenins and therefore it's an arbitrary die. Those are the submissions that his, his lordship is addressing there. And in 497, um, can, can we look at the reasons upon which the judge uh, rejects that argument? And in summary, he says four one, the 415 pattern discloses that the molecule of the claim, including as it does the relevant dye moiety, is a useful compound with beneficial properties. It's an effective sequencing reagent. The beneficial properties are that it can be used in a sequencing by synthesis scheme of the kind described. Fluorescent detection, 20 cycles, 1% error rate, etc. The dye fluoresces, the linker can be cleaved, and the nucleotide can be incorporated by the DNA polymerase. He then compares that with, Mil with Milton. And the last two, three lines of uh, 497, there is valuable technical information in the 415 patent, which was not made available to the public uh, by Milton. So he's, he's there, uh, as I say, evaluating 
the, the value of the sequencing results which are disclosed in the patent. And uh, whilst we're on that page, we're just pausing uh, at paragraph 500, the judge uh, refers to what he regards as a striking point, that despite the narrow scope of the claim, MGI infringes it uh, using the claim molecule. And he says he hasn't taken that into account, although it might be said to be at least some evidence from which one would be entitled to infer that the molecule is useful. So, so far, we have the judge uh, having made findings as to the common general knowledge, having looked at the results in the 415 pattern, having evaluated those results uh, in terms of technical contribution. And uh, he then uh, goes on uh, to uh, assess the capacity for interactions between the constituent parts of the claim molecule. And in 502, which my little friend showed you, he uh, refers there to the claim being seen as a combination of two aspects. So there's the derivatized dye, what he refers to as the derivatized dye, and then the derivatized nucleotide plus the linker LN3. And uh, he goes on, and I, we can pick it up in paragraph 510. 510, which uh, your lordships have seen already. But he is there referring to uh, the evidence being clear that these two aspects, so in other words, the derivatized dye on the one hand and the linker nucleotide combination are capable of interacting with each other. Potential for interaction which is uh, uh, potentially unhelpful. And um, he says more of essentially empirical school person will not know whether or not there is in fact an interaction until a test is done. Not burdensome but they would still need to be to, to, they, but they would still need to be done. Now skip over the comparison with Sabah because uh, in paragraph 511 uh, and in paragraph 512, uh, the judge is uh, also considering um, uh, 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 other potential interactions. So in 511, he is talking about the uh, interaction. The dye fluoresces satisfactorily in the 415 pattern because, in fact, the linker and the nucleotide do not interact with it in an unfavorable way. So that's the linker nucleotide combination with interacting with the dye. Then he says the dye linker combination, which is different from one tested in Milton, does not in fact prevent incorporation of the nucleotide with the DNA polymerase. It might have, but it didn't. So there he's looking at the dye plus the linker interacting with the nucleotide. And the importance there is the judge is picking up on what he identified right at the outset of his uh, account of the common general knowledge as one of the important things, or one of the important features of a sequence and reagent. Um, and that is that uh, the, uh, the fluorophore does not interact uh, with the, with the uh, nucleotide in such a way as to prevent incorporation of that nucleotide into the, uh, the growing strand. And then 512, he's looking again at, a, at, a, at another form of interaction. He's looking at the interaction uh, between uh, either element of the linker nucleotide combination and the fluorophore. So what the judge has got firmly in mind in all of this analysis, in my respectful submission, is uh, interactions between uh, each of the three constituent elements uh, of the claimed molecule. And he's got particular in mind uh, not only the effect uh, that the linker and or the nucleotide can have on the uh, photochemical properties of the fluorophore, but also he's got firmly in mind the potential effect that the dye, or the fluorophore, uh, uh, alone or with the linker can have upon the capacity of the molecule to be incorporated into uh, the DNA strand. Um, well, those are the key findings that I rely upon uh, uh, so far. And could I just make some brief submissions uh, on those facts before turning to the law? If your lordships uh, turn up paragraph 422 of the judgment, <coughs> this is uh, example five of the patent. 
And in, in this case, the uh, nucleotide is thymidine, but the claim uh, is not limited to any particular nucleotide because the judge said at 450, nothing turns on that. But uh, assume this um, uh, exercise, if, if you will, my lords. The skilled person has made or is presented uh, with the compound that is depicted here. No, nothing more than that. Just that. Here is the compound. Now, the skilled person uh, would uh, be able to identify, uh, at least at some level of generality, groups of atoms, moieties, within the overall structure, which are capable of conferring on the molecules certain characteristics. So on the left-hand side, there is a xanthine core with a dependent aromatic ring. And de delocalized electrons within that region will confer on the molecule certain photochemical properties. On, on the right-hand side, there is a nucleotide, which may allow the molecule to be incorporated by DNA polymerase into a growing strand of DNA. And between the dimoiety and the nucleotide is a linker which includes uh, at least a potentially cleavable azide group. Now, the skilled person would be able, at least at some level of generality, to notionally divide up the molecule into those three constituent moieties. But as the judge records in paragraph 435 in the, his findings on the common general knowledge, the characteristics of individual moieties within a chemical structure are influenced by their environment. Now, for any moiety, that environment includes parts of the molecule, that is to say, other moieties, with which it interacts. Now, those interactions can be between parts of the molecule which appear distinct when drawn out on a flat page like this, or on account of the actual three-dimensional shape of the molecule those interactions may be unfavorable. So the linker or the nucleotide might adversely affect the photochemical properties of the fluorophore. And the fluorophore moiety, or the fluorophore combined with the linker, might inf interfere with the ability of DNA polymerase to incorporate the molecule in a sequencing reaction. Now, whether or to what extent those interactions occur is unpredictable. And therefore, my lords, whilst those moieties uh, uh, may be found in separate items of prior art and can be notionally combined uh, in the manner shown in the claim, the act of combining them creates, in respect of each moiety, a new environment an environment which may adversely affect its properties. And it is in that sense that this case, uh, my lords, is so fundamentally different from any previous authority or example in which the law of collocation has been considered. In no other case is there, or has there been, any suggestion that the functional characteristics of one or more of the elements of the invention are capable of being uh, adversely affected merely by the making of the combination. And uh, for reasons which uh, we will come on to, my submission to your lordships is that the judge was right to distinguish the present case from Sabah. He could have gone further and said, well, actually, there's no other collocation case that, that I'm aware of in which uh, the arguments have not proceeded on the same basis. But he dealt with Sabbath there. And, and secondly, and we'll look at his judgment, he was right to find that the functional relationship between the constituent parts of this molecule includes non-interference.
my lords, that's the, uh, the, uh, the short introduction. As far as the law is concerned, I'm not sure that there is actually any dispute between uh, my learned friend uh, and I, uh, or any dispute between uh, either of us and the judge as to uh, the correct uh, 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 question to be posed. And can I show you what I mean by that? If your lordships take uh, the judgment below, uh, and the judge, uh, as you saw, uh, courtesy of my own friend, uh, starts at 460 with an account of the, of the law, that account runs uh, over to 469. And my, my learned friends, uh, in, in uh, uh, their skeleton argument and uh, my learned friend today, uh, don't uh, quibble with uh, anything that the judge says uh, in his account of the relevant question. Um, and in particular, if one looks at paragraph 465, uh, although they quibbled with it below, they don't quibble with it on appeal. You'll see in 465 that uh, I drew uh, the judge's attention to uh, an extract uh, from uh, Lord, Dom Lord Tomlin's speech, which your lordship has seen. And uh, I referred the judge to Lord Tomlin's way of characterising um, the, the first kind of case, in other words, a case where there was a single invention. Uh, have some working interrelation producing a new or improved result. MGI suggests this is wrong in the light of Sabbath. I don't believe it is, provided it's understood in the context of what Lord Hoffman says. The new or improved result has to be the result of the relationship between the parts of the combination. That is the uh, the judge um, the judge's formulation of uh, one way of assessing whether there is a single invention or two. And as we will see, uh, it is that formulation uh, which he then applies in due course in deciding that uh, this is not a, a mere collocation and, uh, uh, and uh, the fact that non-interference between the constituent parts is uh, a relevant component of the functional relationship. So I don't actually think there's a dispute as to the law um, that your lordships uh, are being invited to decide. Um, I'm very happy to make some submissions to you about um, uh, how uh, um, Lord Hoffman's judgment in Sabaf is to be understood in the light of the EPA authorities, but in the light of the position that my learned friend takes, I don't think um, we need to go further certainly my submissions, then simply point you to, to that paragraph of the judgment and it, it being agreed between uh, the parties that that was uh, a correct approach uh, for the judge to take in this case. For my part, I find it a little difficult to see the analogy between the technical context in those cases and the one that we're dealing with here. With, with, um, with the Hobbes? Yes. It's perfectly clear what the new or improved result was. Because it's or, or, or wasn't. Or, or wasn't. But, but um, it's what, what they were trying to achieve, and, and what they did in, in order to try and achieve it, was to combine two separate and independent things yes. that didn't um, work together in such a way to, to create right. anything new. But what's the comparison here? What's your improved result compared with what? My, my, new, improve, my new improved result is a new molecule which can be used for effective SBS sequencing. That is what is disclosed in the specification. That is the result. That is the information which the judge has referred to as valuable technical information. And that is an effect, which in due course I'll make my submissions clear, I hope. That is an effect which, properly understood, is a combined effect. Is it your submission that a single molecule is always a single invention? Um, no, it's not, my lord. Um, plainly, there are circumstances in which one could conceive of single molecules um, which evidently, particularly if they're very large and they have com 
completely distinct functional groups or functional moieties uh, which would be treated as uh, separate inventions. I mean, the example that I would so, think so of would the, be something like a, an it, antibody. It's the possibility of interaction between the two moieties which means you have to look at, at the, the whole as a single invention, is it? It is, it is the possibility of an interaction which, if it turns out, actually is not the case, and that interaction was one which was anticipated could be adverse. That on the particular facts of this case, where we're dealing with quite a small molecule, properly understood, and this is what I think the judge in my submission was doing, was rightly concluding that the absence of interference could amount, and indeed does amount on the facts that were before him, to an interaction in the sense that is contemplated or required for a single invention. I've written this down as a summary of what the judge may have found. Yeah. You'll probably tell me this is nonsense, but I'm going to try it. The combination of the three constituent elements includes one or more beneficial, non-obvious, non-interactions. Non-obvious. Uh, well, no. I think uh, interactions. Non-non-obvious, non-interaction. No. no. He, he, not non-obvious interactions. He, he's 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 understood that he needs to find a. Can I put it in the way the judge put it? Yes. That's most clear. What he's what he's identified is he needs to see a functional interaction between the two components. That's that's what he's asked himself, and that's the question which he's answered. And uh, what he's decided, uh, rightly on the facts before him, is that are the properties which derive from that functional relationship? Answer yes. Those useful properties are utility in SBS, the disclosure of valuable technical information insofar as the molecule can be used for SBS. And that functional interrelationship includes non interference. I think that's just a way of putting the same point. Is it? All right. <laughs> In which case, I apologise. <laughs> the non-interactions lead to the functional utility of yes. the combination. The non-interference. Yes. The non-interference. Non um, and and I'm, I'm sorry, my lord, I'm jibbing no, it. Me I'm, using, jib I'm jibbing using, into your you, word. Um, you're using direction. the right language and I'm not. I think that's the... That's well, the uh, that, I'm <laughs> using the language that the judge uses. Yes. And uh, I'm supporting the judge's analysis. And the language that I'm using, just if it, if it helps, is paragraph 514, where he says, put it another way, the molecule of claim one is a single invention. Its beneficial properties, which I've referred to already, derive from the functional relationship, which includes non-interference between the constituent parts. And one, I think just for absolute completeness, which includes the unpredictable non-interference between the, uh, the constituent parts. And well, since uh, just before you go yes. on, since we're uh, we're asking a question at this stage, it might be helpful if I um, add my question, which is, what is your submission as to whether? The question of whether it's one invention or two is a matter of interpretation of the specification and hence law, or a question of fact. Um, and all the, in, in my submission, it's principally it starts with a question of law, and uh, then evidence can be adduced uh, uh, one way or the other. Um, to establish or disestablish any particular uh, uh, interaction uh, that is disclosed in the specification. Forgive me if I don't say I don't find that a terribly clear answer. I'm sorry. I mean, 
what you've said is that evidence is admissible, mm. fine, but that doesn't really answer the question of whether it's a question of law or a question of fact. Um, l let me let me try again, my lord. Let me try again. I've articulated uh, or placed some weight upon the judge's uh, findings as the common general knowledge. Sir? Uh, that common general knowledge as to which evidence is plainly admissible is to be taken into account uh, when reading the disclosures of documents. And uh, therefore, my lord, I think properly analysed, it is a question of law. What the document discloses when read together with the common general knowledge. And uh, in, in, in a sense, that may be of some assistance to this extent that my learned friend's uh, analysis of this case and the case which he urged uh, in front of uh, uh, them, uh, Mr. Justice Bird, was that one could take that molecule and slice it into the three constituent parts. Uh, and I have accepted that at some level of generality one would do that. But in terms of precision of slicing, if the common general knowledge is, as the judge has found, that these are three moieties which are capable of interacting with one another, it's fundamentally wrong to start dividing it up into discrete integers. Or rather, put it another way, compare it with a Sabbath case, or compare it with a sausage machine case sausage machine case is easier. A mincer and a filler. Those are clearly defined, discrete integers, devices, machines within the combination. And they can be analysed in terms of, do they, when put together, produce a combined effect, yea or nay? The starting that, point that, with... That sounds like a factual question. Whether you put the mincer and the filler, when you put the mincer and the filler into one box, whether they have any interaction between each other. Uh, but it's, it's a question, at the moment I'm thinking about in terms of where do, where do I see, do I see two or more inventions in the claim? Well, the claim says, I've invented a single mincer filler machine. Yeah. And the answer to it is, no, you haven't. All you've done is you've taken an old mincer and an old filler and you've put them in the same box and they don't interact. But, but the starting point, my lord, in, in, in that analysis, is what are the two integers that I have to consider? And in the case of a sausage machine, maybe, maybe it's too simple a case, in, in the case of a sausage machine, one can simply see, as a matter of language, what the relevant components are, uh, the relevant bits. Right, the so, so is the analysis as follows. Take the sausage machine case. Yeah. The pattern simply says, put the two together, grinder them. Yeah. The pattern doesn't say that there's any advantage. And the skilled person, from their common general knowledge, wouldn't think that there was any potential disadvantage. Correct. Therefore, all that's happened is that two independent things have been put together. Yeah. By contrast, take the scenario where the patent asserts that there is synergy. Then you assume that that's true unless and until it's falsified by the party attacking the patent. Yeah. Take the scenario where the skilled person with their common general knowledge would think that there would not be synergy but destructive effects. Yeah. And the patent he demonstrates to the contrary. Yeah. And, and my lord, that is close to what we have here. 
Well, that is except the, what, here it's not quite that extreme. No, it's it's not it's not quite because because the highest you put it is the, the skilled person would think there was the potential. Indeed, my lord, my lord, and, and I, I apologise. I was not seeking to equate it directly. It's close yeah. to, but that is that is what we have here based on the common general knowledge. There is a potential for an adverse interaction, but but do do we arrive at the position that it is? A question in the first instance of interpretation of the patent specification in the light of the common general knowledge, unless and until the party attacking the patent falsifies something that's stated in the patent. I feel terribly humbled because your lordships have been asking me that, this question for uh, about five or ten minutes, and uh, the way and I, the way in which your lordship has just put it to me. Um, it is, and I should have been able to spot this myself, that is actually the correct analysis. One takes the common general knowledge, one reads the specification with the benefit of that common general knowledge, one can make um, evaluations as to the potential for interactions, adverse interactions, whatever, based upon the common general knowledge in the specification, and that stands until and insofar as there is evidence that is adduced one way or the other. All right, thank you. Um, right. So what the judgment, yes, can we go to the judgment? And what the judge has done in, in my uh, submission is to resolve the collocation question uh, in two ways. Uh, and one sees, first of all, uh, what he does in paragraphs 510 to 512, where he concludes, you see this at the end of paragraph 512, the collocation principle does not apply, uh, which in my submission is the judge uh, finding that this is not particular uh, 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 claim, a, a mere collocation. Now, if one looks at his reasoning uh, between paragraphs 510 and 512, it is essentially based upon distinguishing the present facts from those that arose in Sabbath. And th the key distinction uh, and, and what the judge is, uh, is doing there in terms of his analysis is he's saying that a mere collocation cannot be said to arise where the skilled person would believe that the elements in question might interact adversely with one another and would need to test the combination in order to establish whether or not, whether that was or was not the case. And it turns out uh, that they don't. Now, none of that applied in Sabbath. And, and so the question for your lordships, or the question which I pose, is, is that distinction, the one which the judge drew between the present facts and those in Sabbath, a relevant distinction? And in my submission, it was. And it was for these reasons, that if as was the case in Sabbath, but I'm putting the proposition uh, a little more generally, if there is no reason to think that the integers uh, of the claim will have an adverse effect upon each other when combined, and indeed the expectation is that they will operate in their normal way, that is to say, in the same way that each operates alone, in those circumstances, there is no room for invention in making the combination. For there to be an invention, it can only reside in the existence of some technical effect which results from the combination, without which the claim is treated as containing two inventions. As Lord Hoffman said at paragraph 24, two inventions do not become one by being included in the same hardware if they operate independently of each other. 
or, as Mr. Justice Laddie uh, put it at first instance in Sabbath, he said the skilled person is not given a ration card, allowing him to use only one obvious device at a time. If it's obvious to use one particular device, and obvious to use another, there can be no invention in using the two together. But different considerations may apply where the devices interact. So that's the, that's the insofar as one can articulate a policy that sits behind uh, the, the principles of collocate, mere collocation inventions. Uh, in, in my respectful submission, one of the most satisfactory explanations of it is actually Mr. Justice Laddie's account, although that has, of course, been trumped by uh, Lord Hoffman, although put in fairly similar terms. If it's obvious yeah. to use one, so, so use two. Can I, can I express that submission in my own words to see if I've understood it and check whether I've, I've got it right? So we look at the reasoning in the passage that you're discussing, and perhaps the convenient way to put it is to focus on the sentence that Mr. Hinchcliffe most relies upon, yeah. which is the sentence in 511, second sentence, the diafluoresce is satisfactory in the 415 pattern, because in fact, the linker and the nucleotide do not interact with it in an unfavorable way. And you say, precisely, that's the invention. Absolutely. That's the con technical contribution. Absolutely. And you, your lordship beat me to it because I was then going to contrast the factual circumstance of cases like Sabah with what we have here. And what I was going to put to your lordships was the counter scenario. Assume that there is reason to think that the elements may have an adverse effect upon each other when combined. In other words, the act of making the combination creates the possibility of an adverse interaction. And the patentee demonstrates that there is, in fact, no such interaction. There is then room for invention in the making of the combination, certainly where, as in this case, the disclosure of non-interference constitutes, as the judge held, valuable technical information. And why? Uh, I asked rhetorically, is that a combined technical effect? Because it is the very act of combining the integers which creates the possibility of interference. And if interference does not occur, that is because the environment in which the integer uh, now resides is a favorable one. So take the fluorophore of the claim, for example, uh, what I'll call die 2 its photochemical properties are capable of being adversely affected by its environment. And that environment includes other parts of the molecule. That's consistent with, based on the findings of the common general knowledge. Now, if, when combined with the other elements of the molecule, it produces a clear fluorescent signal, which can be reliably detected, which allows sequencing by synthesis for 20 cycles with an error rate of less than 1%. Those fluorescent properties are properties which arise from the favorable environment in which it now resides. That is the submission. Yeah, and the question only arises because the skilled person couldn't predict this in advance, because if they could predict it, the combination would be obvious anyway, and the question wouldn't arise. And it wouldn't arise, absolutely right. Yeah. Well, so what I've, what I've done so far is to address you on what I submit is the first basis upon which the judge uh, decides that uh, this is not a mere collocation. That is to distinguish the facts of this case from those in Sabbath. And then in paragraph 514, he says, putting it another way, the molecule of claim one is a single invention. Its beneficial properties derive from the functional relationship, which includes non-interference between the constituent parts. And I, I think we, we, your, your, your lordships and I have had that discussion. It's, it's essentially a follow-on from the reasoning that gets him to 
finding that this is not a, a mere collocation. And that's why he says putting it another way. And that's exactly what he's doing. There is a combined effect. And that combined effect and the combined effect that provides the beneficial properties is one in which non-interference, unpredictable non-interference, is an integral part. And I, I did say to your lordships, uh, when I was uh, looking at the law, I identified uh, paragraph 465, the question uh, which the judge uh, considered was one to ask. So is the new or improved, it says the new or improved result has to be the result of the relationship between the parts of the combination. Now, I appreciate that in paragraph 514, the language is not identical, but he is finding in 514 beneficial properties, in other words, a new or improved result, deriving from the functional relationship between the constituent parts. It is, in substance, uh, the question which he is identified in 465, which he answers in 514, uh, and in my respectful submission, answers it precisely on the right basis. For the rather peculiar facts of this case, and uh, as, I, as I've uh, indicated already, a, a case which is miles away from the essential premise upon which Sabaf and other collocation uh, cases uh, proceed, namely that uh, there's no reason to think that the integers of the claim will have an adverse effect on each other when combined. Indeed, the expectation is that they will continue to operate in their normal way. The other way he puts it at 512, which I think is really putting the same point a different way, is the skilled person would hope the molecule works satisfactorily. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, skill, the skilled person would hope the molecule, that is, the molecule as a whole, did what you wanted it to do. He would hope. You would hope that. But unlike in Sabbath, you'd have absolutely no reason for thinking, if you put the two things together, that they wouldn't both do what you expected them to do. And that's exactly what the judge says in the uh, sentence bridging uh, the page in paragraph 5. And yes. Long way from Sabbath, there's no basis. Case of thinking there might be an interaction, then looking to find out. It's two aspects of Sabbath, they simply don't interact. The skilled person did not have to test them to find out. So that, that is, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Lord Chief. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm adopting what uh, your Lordship has suggested to me. Well, that is why, actually, in the end, this is a quite short point. It's a short point that, that turns upon the judge having asked himself the right question as a matter of law and having made findings, none of which are challenged, uh, as to the common general knowledge, the nature of the interactions, and importantly, the capacity for uh, different moieties within the molecule to adversely I interact uh, upon each other. Um, could I just very briefly um, uh, address you on uh, a point which my uh, learned friend made which is to he relies upon the fact that there's no finding by the judge that the lack of interference would be surprising or non-obvious uh, and my lord I don't understand that submission in the light of what the judge has found uh, in relation to the common general knowledge at paragraphs 433 to 435 the nature of the valuable technical information which is disclosed by the specification that's paragraph 497 and paragraph 512 the possibility of interference and the need to test it it's empirical I'm sorry it's empirical it's empirical now I I've been very quick, so let me just check. Um, well, as you said, it's a short point at the end of the day. So, if you have any further questions for me. No, no, no. thank you. <coughs> well, there was just a few points in, in reply. Um, point one, and a friend stressed. Um, 
several times was the, uh, the usefulness of the molecule in, in sequencing. And he took you to paragraph 497 of, of the judgment. Um, but if I can take your, uh, which is where the judge referred to combination being a useful compound with uh, beneficial properties because it can be used in sequencing. But um, of course if we go back to Saba, so that's the first volume of the authority. Well, just before you do that, can we be clear um, that there's no dispute about what he's saying in 497? Because putting it in my own words, the submission that Mr. Ackland made was that in 497, the judge not merely says it's, it's a useful compound with beneficial properties, but what he's saying is, is it's really the, the, the sentence in the middle. The difluoresces, the linker can be cleaved, and the nucleotide can be incorporated by the DNA polymerase. So it's doing three different things. And none of those things interferes with each other. And I appreciate your argument is you say that it's doing the three different things in the same way as if they stood on their own. Yes. But that's that's the really where the dividing line between the parties lies, isn't it? Yes, I would agree. And just specifically picking up on, on the last one, that it can be incorporated by the DNA polymerase, one always remember and go back to paragraph four hundred and seventy. A, which is the judge's findings in relation to Milton. Uh, he says, it would have been obvious for a skilled person given Milton to make the Lincoln nucleotide combination with a view to conjugating that molecule to a suitable dye which may have to be derivatized. They would make that with a reasonable prospect that if they tested it by sequencing by synthesis, it would not interfere. In other words, it would have been obvious that it wouldn't have. It was a reasonable prospect it would because they'd already done that in Milton with the size 3 dye. So that's some, something the school person would have understood from, um, from Milton itself. And then um, in relation to the, the fluorescent properties, as we say, remember, the, the, the dye still fluoresces, the link is still linked, the link is still cleaved, uh, and uh, they do or they would have done uh, had they not been uh, connected. The point that I was going to make in, on the basis of Sabbath, and perhaps we don't need to, to go back to it, is that in, in paragraph 16 of the judgment, Rob Hoffman makes the point that uh, the two features of Sabbath that were uh, the air intake from above and the radial venturi, um, although neither may the other function any differently or produce any combined effect, except they each contribute separately slim hob, which is suitable for a work surface over a cover. So the hob was a better hob. The hob had advantages over what was known before. That in itself isn't enough to say we can forget about collocation, this is a single invention. You still have to look beyond that. Uh, and the key question is, is the first part of the I just read out, which is whether either part of the collocation made the other function any different. It can be beneficial to put two inventions together, but it's still two two inventions. It, it can be beneficial to put two inventions together, and if they don't interact and they don't make the other function any differently, then you still may get a better product at the end of the day, but it's still two inventions. Uh, and um, and, and I think a related point is my Lord Lord Justice Warby asked the question about what the the relevant comparison was, and my submission on that is what was always what I, the sentence I read out from Lord Hoffman, which is, does one make the other function in any different way? And, and when we say, well, when you analyse this case along those terms, then the dye still fluoresces adequately, the linker still connects, the linker will still cleave under the right conditions, and neither affects the way the other one does it. So one's that, that's the relevant comparison. That's one, what, what look, one, one's looking for. Uh, and 
friends. Um, my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Arnold asked my learned friend what the relevant approach was. And, uh, and my learned friend, I think on his second time, uh, second attempt, said that it was um, it was a question of uh, interpretation in the light of the, of the patterns, in the light of the common general knowledge. In but the absence of contrary evidence. In the absence of contrary evidence. But, my Lord, as we saw from the patterns, firstly, the patterns refers to the various parts of the collocation in the way that we analyse the various parts of the collocation. It sees the die, it sees the linker, it sees the nucleotide, so it puts them together in those, those building blocks. And, um, and the pattern doesn't suggest that there's any interaction between the various parts. It doesn't suggest there's any improvement in the properties, it doesn't suggest there's any change in the properties. Well, it certainly doesn't suggest any synergy. That's uh, not, not even suggested. No. Um, but what it demonstrates is that there's no adverse interaction. And the qu you say that's not enough. Yes. It, it, it demonstrates that, that one particular nucleotide labelled with the dye and the linker can be incorporated in 20 rounds of sequencing along with three other nucleotides. Um, and we say that that, that doesn't show you no adverse interaction, uh, and what that means is that neither end of the molecule affects the way the other works, and that's precisely what the Supreme Court of the, the House of Lords in, in the Sabaf case says is the, is the characteristic of a, a collocation, and for that reason we say uh, that this, this, is, this is, when analysed properly, uh, a collocation. Unless you've got any questions, those are my submissions. Uh, no, thank you very much. Well, um, counsel on this branch of the case are to be commended for the succinctness of their submissions, um, which isn't really a dig at the others. Um, so thank you very much. Um, it's excellent uh, for all concerned to have completed this within two days. Um, however, you have obviously given us a lot to think about. Um, so uh, we will obviously be reserving our judgments and um, handing them down in writing in due course in the normal way. Um, I'm not going to make any promises as to when that's going to be, um, but I'm sure you will understand that uh, there is, to put it at its lowest, no guarantee that it will be before Christmas. Um, when you receive the drafts, uh, as I'm sure you are all well aware, um, that is for you to correct any typos and obvious um, and incontestable factual mistakes, um, not to re-argue the case. Um, at that point, please try and, uh, and agree an order to give effect to what we have decided, if you can. If there is disagreement as to what consequential orders should be made, uh, please make brief written submissions and we will decide what order to make 